Hi, hi, it's Allison Arngram, and this is the Allison Arngram Show. Yes, I'm Allison Arngram, although some of you may recognize me as evil Nellie Olson from Little House on the Prairie. But tonight, I'm Allison Arngram, and it's the Allison Arngram Show. And here on the Allison Arngram Show, we talk about things that make you feel good. The movies and the TV shows that made us feel good, and the people who made them. And people who are doing things now to make the world a better and more interesting place. And oh, I've got one tonight. So, this is a marvelous man that I met a few years ago doing a web series. Yes, he played my, my husband. Okay, it was a dream sequence. It wasn't like it was really my husband. He's like my husband in a dream sequence flashback, but it was adorable. Um, it was when we did that life interrupted thing, and he was the handsome husband. And I was in my 50s gears a lot. So, this marvelous man, well, he has had quite the career. He does, he does everything. You know, he has a little resume in the back of his book that's just out. And I was reading it and I said, you know, it's not that long, yet it is the resume apparently of six different people that are somehow one guy. Because it's like, oh, yes, actor, LA-based actor and writer and little modeling and film appearances and Scrooge and Marley's, Ebenezer Scrooge, Spa Night, Joshua Tree, 1951, all these lovely movies, guest starring roles, all the usual things, NCIS, Modern Family, Grey's Anatomy, et cetera, et cetera. And then diverse stage acting career from Broadway, et cetera. Naked Boys singing, his comedy songs, most versatile, musical comedy whore, all these lovely. But he also continues to like, wait, now we're doing musical comedy whore. Yes. And he continues his anti-shame, anti-ageism, pro-nudity and sexuality mission with his work in erotic photos. He also helps people unclutter their lives and environment through his personal organization business address the mess wait what this is all one guy yes this is all one guy and he is amazing and his name is david pebsner hey <laughs> but you're wearing a shirt oh you're dressed yes good hi <laughs> hello <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm just exhausted from having, having, you know, having listened to you read that. I'm like, oh, that is my life. Some so people say, "What are you doing lately?" And I'm like, "You, ha you got an hour, you know." Yeah. Now, of course, I, it's hilarious. We started right off with that photo, but I think that set the tone. So, if anyone's wondering, it's like, and there you are. So, yes. Oh, I missed it. Hmm. Oh, they did. There was a little underwear shot. It was adorable. So. Oh, okay. Well. So yeah, it, I read your book. I read your book, "Damn Shame," and for those one, yes, that's "Damn Shame," as in "Damn." shame to hell with it um i was like well this should be interesting because i did not know all the things you did well, i guess he's in musical comedy he does this and then i was like whoa dude really uh, <laughs> and it was marvelous um absolutely fascinating because yes you've had the usual typical la tv career but with all this great theater stuff but you've also really jumped into the anti-ageism, anti-sexism, pro-positive body image world of, yes, hi, no, I'm not 20, and here I am, ta-da, and it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Now, we, we met doing a kooky web series called Life Interrupted um, about an ex-child star. Oh, wait, I'm an ex-child star, but I wasn't the ex-child star in this. It was about Mason Reese, famous for the Underwood Devil Ham commercials. And I play his ex-wife, who has now married a woman, played by the gorgeous Erin uh, okay. uh, Murphy, yeah. from the witch, Tabitha. Tabitha and Nellie. Okay, well. Um, so we did this thing, but Mason has dreams of how it all could have been. And there's a fabulous opening, insane flashback dream sequence where I am in full 50s drag with this fabulous curly do and big Lucy red lipstick in this kitchen. Go, do, 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 I made a roast and a cake. Mason, darling. And you come gliding in in a suit, just as dapper and suave as the handsome TV husband. And we have our lovely kissing scene. We were Donna Reed and, Car and Carl Betts. I mean, we were. Yeah, yeah. dear. And then, of course, if you wake up, poor Mason wakes up and is like, oh, God, my life is not yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to be Dream Mason. You were Dream Mason. You were yeah. Dream Mason. Marvel. Yes, we shot it in a real kitchen and, and we had a blast. We did have a really good time. No, it was and great because I got to meet so many of you, you know, people that I watched on TV, you know, for all my life. And it was just peopled with it, you know, with, with you guys. And it was so much fun meeting everybody and working with everybody. We had a ball. 
My mom was played by Dawn Wells, Marianne. Uh, Michael Lerner from the Waltons was in it. It was just this fabulous hodgepodge of like all your favorite TV stars jammed. It was <laughs> really crazy. I was like, when they offered it to me, I was like, are you kidding? I've got to <laughs> <laughs> Right? I pay the you to do this, you the know? The brilliant Stephen Wishnoff cooked up this thing, wrote it. It was just, it was so cute. It was so funny. It was so adorable. And so, yes, yeah, so you were now in the catalog of people who have played my husband on, on TV now. Uh, <laughs> it's on the list of things. I'm reading your book. I came in, okay. You know, she said growing up, like Skokie, Illinois, and this nice, nice Jewish boy. And you did, you did Fiddler on the Roof. You were actually in the Broadway revival, Fiddler on the Roof. I did. I did. That was my, my first and only Broadway show. I did another tour of a pre-Broadway thing that never went in, but um, it was so exciting because it was a show that, you know, as a Jewish guy, and I went to see, it was one of the first musicals I saw on tour. My parents took mm -hmm. me to see it in Chicago with Luther Adler, and um, and, and it, so it just, it always had kind of an effect on me, and I loved the movie with Topol, and then I finally got to do the show with him on tour, and then we played in New York for like 10 months, so it was so, it's, it, you know, being on Broadway is a lot of fun, I have to say. <laughs> Incredible. Marvelous. Stuff. And then you, of course, are a musical comedy person. That's what you set out to be initially right. and everything. So, and you <laughs> took part of wonderful musical that I actually saw and you wrote songs, you wrote songs for it. I was in Vegas, you know, it was like right after my book came out. So like 2010, 2011, I was at the Onyx doing my show. It's, my show's Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. You know, I was looking at the titles of your show and all of your shows are, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whore. Et cetera. <laughs> Naked this, whore that, Dan. I'm like, no, <laughs> my show's Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. What, what can I say? Um, there's a show called Naked Boys Singing. I mean, it is literally that. It is Naked Boys Singing. And <laughs> they said, well, we're the other show at the theater. You should come see us on your night off. And I did. Now, what struck me about Naked Boys singing, and it has its classic musical format, except they're, they're, they all are naked. It's a review. It's and a review. It's a review. And there's lots of songs about, about life and sexuality and growing up and people's responses to sexual and coming out as gay and everything in between. But what struck me about it was that it was remarkably innocent. I, there were some numbers. I said, you know, if these people had clothes on. You, you could do this like on a cruise ship for grandma. This is like, it was downright cute. And the way they did stuff, even when it was about sex, it was done in a very innocent, sweet kind of way. That I was yeah. going, I thought this show would be much dirtier than this. This is like a like, nice little thing here. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, anything kind of sexual is kind of covered over with humor in it so and yet and they get the nudity out of the way in the very first number and they're like yep we're gonna be naked and what about it and get over it and here we are so it, it's kind of it's a celebrate it's really a celebration of nudity more than sexuality you know just exactly you, you know celebrating your bodies and feeling free in them because you've got these guys up there dancing and singing and you know making us laugh naked i mean there was a cute song, the one, uh, Nothing But The Radio On, which is a whole reference to the famous, like, Marilyn Monroe thing, what did you have on, if and nothing, the radio. The yeah. And, the, and, the ra and this guy even sings about Nothing But The Radio On, and it's like, it's not dirty. It's, it's regular cute, but like, yeah, 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 nothing but the radio on, I'm naked. Um, and, and so it's amazing. Now, of course, your song, which I guess yours was almost the dirty one in it, Perky, Perky, Little Porn Porn <laughs> Well, you know, the, the thing is that I started writing just for fun. This friend of mine gave me this computer, this like old broken down computer. And I just started writing like poetry, like kind of dirty poetry, but about my fantasies and about my experiences and stuff. And one of the things was my fantasy of being a porn star. And I wrote this kind of funny poem about it. And then I musicalized it thinking nobody's where is this going to go? Nobody what, can do what anything What are you going to like do that. with this? What are you going to put in a cell? What are you <laughs> but I was coming out of, I did a show called When Pigs Fly in New York and I was coming out of it and I saw a friend of mine and he introduced me to his husband and his husband asked what else I do. And I'm like, I'm writing some, you know, dirty little, he's like, well, he said, well, I have a friend who's doing a show in, in LA. They're putting a show together, a review. I said, what's the subject matter? He goes, um, nudity. And I went, are you kidding me? So Finally. that was like, well, well, it was, it was like, oh my God, this is a marriage made in heaven. So I sent off a few songs and they used them. And then 20 something years later, it's still running, you know, it's crazy. 
it, even the song Perky Little Porn Star, as I said, it, it's accent on the perky. There's references to like Deanna Durbin and Tab Hunter. I'm like this. Well, the idea, I mean, to make it, to get it kind of out of the icky realm, you know, the character who sings the song is an old movie lover. And so now that he's in movies, porn films, he still has that thought about when he was a kid watching old movies on TV. And so he, this is his way of being a movie star. So there are references to Deanna Durbin and Tab Hunter and, you know, and because that's the soul of this kid who ends up doing these, you know, the porn films. And he's still, it's still the love of the great Hollywood, the cinema. This is both the cinema. I'm in the movies of, of sorts. <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah, so it was a lot of fun to write and a lot of it, you know, I always put a lot of me and my either my experience or my, you know, head into these songs, you know, excuse the pun. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, yeah, it, and it's very much I mean, I think he even says something about I'm from Skokie, Illinois. I mean, it's like very autobiographical that way. Yes. And you talk in your book, Damn Shape, Fascinating, it's a lot of it is about growing up in like a very typical American family and then realizing that you're gay and coming out and going, mm, my parents are kind of conservative and what do I do? And it's, that's like, boy, that's like everybody's story. Yeah. And you talked about that and that you were such a, such a nice Jewish boy. Um, that I was. So you weren't, I mean, this wasn't, you know, the 1930s. It was more modern when you're coming out here, but it was still difficult. Cause I mean, as you said, you're in Skokie, Illinois, not West Hollywood when this is happening. So how did that work out? You had you talk about the whole thing of like trying to be the ultimate perfect, good, nice Jewish boy, please your parents, but come out as a gay person. Like, yeah. How did that work? <laughs> well, you know, I talk a lot about watching television, and we've talked about that already a little bit. I watched so much television, and if I didn't see it on TV, it didn't exist in real life. So I never <laughs> saw two guys together. I never saw two boys kissing each other. So I knew there was something wrong with me, and. This is how it was all through high school. I kind of felt that same thing. That's a long time to go, you know, where you're where you're thinking like there's something wrong with you and you're not going to fit in. And, you know, you try to fit in and you have girlfriends and you. So eventually it was moving to even college. I was able to come out, but it, there was still a lot of like, you know, I'm still not ready. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I lost my virginity in college, but I wasn't particularly um, uh I, I wasn't very sexual in college as much as I would have liked to have been, as much as everybody else seemed to be. <laughs> when I got to New York. And that's the thing in college. It seems like everyone is having sex. And this is something even straight people have. They go, oh, yeah, I didn't even, like, lose my virginity to my third year in college. And everyone was doing it. And then they get together and they go, what? I thought you were doing it. I wasn't doing it either. And like, well, but except that I went to, you know, I... After I went to University of Michigan for a year, then I went to Carnegie Mellon. And Carnegie Mellon, it's all actors, it's all artists. And believe me, they were all screwing around. I know for a fact. <laughs> Not me, a little bit, you know. Um, but really, I mean, I had, I had my good times. But it was really when I got to New York where I finally felt like I was open. I was going to the bars, you know. But, you know, but then I got to New York right when AIDS was happening. So <laughs> we're just starting out. And so there was that that was kind of like, kind of putting a little bit of a hamper on it but we still had fun you know we still were out there we were still you know many of us being careful and you know and it was just it was it was, it was horrible and it was wonderful well in a way i mean that's something that's also happened is some of the for the younger generation having to be more careful may have been a benefit in sort of slowing things down that you maybe got more out of things and spent more time talking to people well, yes, I, I, in a way, yeah, because we, it, when I got there, we still didn't really know how it was transmitted, you know, and so there was just this, this fear in a lot of people, but some people didn't have that fear, and some people just went about their business, and some of them are not here, but some of them are, you know. Right, right. So we, we all had, I think, varying levels of, of this, you know. Um, and then some caught on early and said, I think I'm going to go with the condoms. It sounds like it's that. That's and, kind you know. of what I did, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that. That was it. But even so, I still was, you know, I would have, I would have liked to have been sluttier when I first moved to New York. Would have been nice, but you know, I was still very scared and very careful. And you know, it was, it was, it was yeah, odd. In, in reading your book, you sound like almost a little shy, and you know, trying to like come out as a, as an actor and as a gay person, going, well, I'd really like to be wild, both wild on stage and then like wild sexually, but. Eh. <laughs> well, also though, and, and I talk about this a lot in the book, and it's something that I've struggled with my whole life. 
I was also kind of going after the guys that I really, that didn't want me, you know, like oh. that I thought didn't want me. And I would go after them, the really gorgeous, you know, um, uh, the ones with the, I love the kind of um, uh, black Irishy, dark hair, kind of hairy chest must. That's what I would go after. And I was this like skinny guy with a big nose and a fro. And so there was a lot of disappointment, but I was not opening myself up to people who were just like great, you know? I was I was totally on looks and, you know, and, and then constantly getting, you know, knocked down and disappointed. So. And I think that's the thing that you talk about a lot in the book that I found fascinating was that the obsession with looks, with appearance, with age, with and perfect body. body. Yeah, having the perfect body and the perfect face and being the right age in the gay community. And I don't think people realize it, but for, for, for me as a woman, it's absolutely terribly familiar to, to straight women that the entire dating scene is, well, how good do you look and how thin are you and how young are you? And, and guys, straight guys going after the impossibly gorgeous tens of the women and then women going after the gorgeous guy, but well, no, you're not really in that category. You're out of your league. Well, and the idea that someone after 30 well if you're in hollywood and a woman after 30 it's certainly after 40 or 50 you're not you're not sexy this is the highly likely to be sexy well conventional um, wisdom you're saying the, right and this is certainly something for women that's not you're not supposed to be embracing your sexuality after a certain age and you're constantly were and it being judged on looks and age and everything and this is something that has happened quite often in the gay community that this this terrible thinking has unfortunately gone. I was like, what? We straight people screwed that up. Please don't adopt that particular trait. <laughs> um, we don't like it over here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Gay marriage and physical exclusiv exclusivity. Yeah. Now, and now, now you've got gay men saying, oh, well, you know, I'm 40, so no one will go out with me. Wait, what? And you attack that full on in your book you're like yeah no <laughs> you're just not looking hard enough and you and i think you know a lot of guys i won't I, I i hate to generalize but for the sake of this conversation i'm going to generalize a lot of guys my age like younger guys the interesting thing is now especially a lot of younger guys like older guys so if you're 40 something years old and you think you're done or you're 50 or i'm not gonna ever meet anybody you are so wrong you are just wrong. You've got to open your eyes. Maybe, maybe there's a there's not a 25 year old for you, but there might be a 45 year old for you, a 50. Like, run the gamut a little more than just this exclusive. Well, that's my type. Oh, you know, I, I get having a type. I do. I still kind of have a type, but they're they're not the only people that I would speak to or <laughs> engage with or try to connect with. You know. It's just the thing of times like, well, you know, for straight men, it's like, so the only women you'll date have to be five foot eleven and blonde. I mean, what what happens if you meet a redhead? I mean, it gets and, no, 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 no. And I know women tell, well, like he needs to be tall, he needs to be this, he needs to be that, and I'm like, that's what you're worried about. Um, with all the other things you could be thinking of, and it often is the person that you don't think is your type. Just dramatically, you wind up meeting someone, go, you know, they're normally not my type, and then suddenly, oh wait, that's the person I fall madly in love with. You don't know and right. these kind of superficial criteria it's it's often a trap and of course in the book i talk about that relationship where i do meet someone exactly like that that was not normally my type and and you know for once finally i engaged in in what i what was supposed to be an adult relationship and ends up being a crap show um <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, but it taught me a lot about opening myself up to you know the unexpected to me to to let give give people a chance beyond just what's on their surface you know and being an escort certainly helped that because right. I and this is a crazy thing in the book just when you think you can't get any wilder with the musicals and the, mu the naked people of the thing and writing <laughs> songs about porn stars and musical comedy horror you talk in the book about like, well, you know, right? I had some fantasies about being porn stars. Well, you know, I think maybe I'd like to be, you know, an escort and have sex with people I don't know and I could pick up money. This could be a thing. And it's the way you talk about it's a matter of factly that you decided to do this. I realize that a lot of people are surprised to find out how many people they know have actually done some form of sex work, yeah. whether it was photos, whether it was now like with the cam girl thing, whether it's that. Sometimes 
it comes out of a negative situation. I mean, I certainly met people who said I was starving, I was on drugs, so I exchanged extra money. Yeah. Then I've met people where they said I was going through this thing in my life and I decided I needed to do this. And it happens. And you're probably, everyone would be very surprised to find out how many of their friends have actually done this. Yeah, at the time, I actually knew a couple of people. And I didn't talk to them about it, about my kind of wanting to do it, because I just thought like, oh, they're going to be like, you know, what are you like? Did, were you molested as a kid? Are you on drugs? I was like, no, none of that. It was something that I felt I needed. To, yes, there was there was kind of a seeking of validation out. Am I the kind of guy someone would pay money to have sex with? Um, there was definitely that. It wasn't just about I needed the money, even though I needed the money. I was working off Broadway in a show and not making enough money. And I didn't want to wait tables anymore. But I found that from the time that I thought I wanted to do it as a, let me see if I can make the grade, to when I actually started doing it, I loved it. Because it, 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 it used so much of who I am, not just sexually, because there was that that I enjoyed very much, but my caretaking, my sense of humor, my, my ability to connect with people. And I felt like I was really making people feel good. You know, some people, you know, like one guy's wife had died recently and he just needed some comfort. And, and you know, they were all di everybody had a different story. So it wasn't just about show up, do the deed, get the money and go. It was not that. Yeah, that would happen every so often. But for the <laughs> most part, everybody had a story, you know. Well, sex work can be kind of like, am I the psychologist? What is happening here? Totally. That's, you know. Totally. And, and, I was, and if I wasn't going to be an actor, I was going to be a shrink. You know, so I, it was, I, when, when I had my interview to be an escort with an actual interview, one of the things that he said was, you know, it's not going to be about just, you know, a bunch of pretty people and having like wild, wonderful sex with them. It's not going to be that. You're going to find guys that you're not necessarily, that you wouldn't necessarily be attracted to outside. And some of them are going to have issues and some of them are going to be like really quiet and, and you're going to have to, you know, but whatever it is, it's your job to make them feel good. And I thought, I think I can do that. And I there did. There is a psychological component where it is you're, you're being a therapist. And there's a lot of different issues involved. Obviously, for, for women versus men, there's a different power balance and straight men and what have you. And it, but there are people, depending on their situation, where they, they do have agency in it, where, yeah, it's a thing they want to do. And as you said, it wasn't so much a trauma thing. It was like, well, yes, is there a self-esteem issue? I want to see if I could, to see if you could, to see if people liked you. Um, but there are people doing that. There are people who, um, as I said, nude photography, nude modeling, they're going, this is the thing I felt I needed to do. I just need, needed to do this. And, well, and as, as far as the modeling, more common than people think. As far as the modeling goes, I think I even say this in the book, I would encourage everyone to take pictures naked. <laughs> I would, it is such a freeing feeling. You don't have to put them out there. You can delete them the moment you shoot them. But there's something about that experience, about letting go of, of the veil and, and the shame and saying, like, well, I don't like my body or I no, I don't. Well, nobody's going to see it except you, you know, or if you have somebody take the pictures for you, whatever. But there is something so freeing about standing in front of a camera and just going, this is who I am. I mean, wow. I've shot guys, besides me posing, I have shot a couple of guys. and. It makes them feel great. I send them, I send them the photos and they, you know, they use them however they want to. Sometimes they just, you know, I just wanted to do it. Well, it's interesting because I, I got to talk to the late, the famous Betty Page pinup model before oh, wow. she died. A marvelous woman. Big fan of Little House in the Prairie. Hello, good figure. Um, so great. she was lovely. And one of the things she talked about, there was one biography of her that she actually said, okay, I authorize that. That's got the right story. And one thing she talked about was that when she was young and she was getting so-called straight jobs, she had to try to support her sister. They left home. The home they lived in was not good at all. They like got away from their dad. She was taking care of her sister. She worked in department stores and she worked in offices. She was very smart. And But this was, wow, the 50s. It was awful. The level of sexual harassment for a woman her age sure. and a nice looking young girl in the 50s. She's every office job. She was chasing around, the, getting chased around the desk in every department store. The guy's hassling her. So then she met this guy says, do you, do you want to just pose for some pictures? And, and there was a lot of stuff that wasn't even new. There was the bikini stuff and whatnot. And then she did some nude ones. Well, the guy's wife was there. <laughs> and he was such a gentleman. He's completely all business. And she started doing, working with photographers. And she said, you know, 
most of the photographers I worked with were absolutely 100% all business, did not hit on me, did not harass me, were not mashers. The wife was there. They were all straight up. We're done shooting the photos. We got dressed. We went to dinner. She said, all the wholesome, straight, moral jobs I had, some guy was trying to have sex with me and trying to assault me while I'm working in the department store or the office. And I was constantly sexually harassed. But when I took off my clothes and took the pictures, everybody was really polite. Nobody sexually harassed me. What the heck is going on? Well, and that's interesting so you say she that. Said, I'm going to go do this. <laughs> what a, that's a great story. And one of the things that I found, I talk a little bit about this in the book too, is I've been in situations where I have been naked or not wearing a lot and people have been clothed watching me or sometimes with a photographer who's clothed. That's going to be weird. It's power. It feels so powerful. For me, it's like, because I'm like, for anybody who's sitting out there who may have any kind of hangups about their body, I'm the one here going like, I don't have hangups about my body. So, you know, so it, it, there is a kind of powerful feeling in that, you know, and, and yeah, you, you, they tell us to imagine this. If you're nervous, imagine the audience you're speaking to all being naked, but you did it the other way around. You were naked. And they were close. Right. And I even say something about that because that whole, that whole adage about imagine everybody naked. I'm like, as if being in, in their underwear, as if being in their underwear is embarrassing or something. So I don't ascribe to that at all. Like, why should that be, make me feel better because they're in their underwear? That's not embarrassing to me. I'd be like, great. I wish I could get in my underwear too, you know? Well, that's what the Betty Pages thing. She said, well, I was never taught that, that my body was sinful or dirty. And she was actually, she was quite a religious woman. She did attend a church and, and she just said, no, but the human body's not sinful. And uh, she, when she basically retired, uh, she was not really making a lot of money. She was like in social security, but you know, she didn't drink or smoke and she made all her own clothes and was like a vegetarian. So she said, I don't need much money. And then finally, a relative stepped in and said, do you know about these books and greeting cards and th what? And um, they wound up calling a lawyer and getting a licensing agreement. She got a bit of cash. And she did finally oh, get. Oh, how smart. Oh, she did. She finally did get paid for that. And she was living in a lovely condominium in her old age and did that, quite you well. Know it could go either okay. way. She could have, she could have gone to the, oh, I'm embarrassed and I'm going to fight it or the ownership of it. You know, if oh, you, yeah. That kind of thing, I talk about that in the book too, that when you own up to your history, to your, you know, nobody can harm you. You know, I yeah, talk about thing, see, Betty was, I said she was the last free person on earth because, um, and she said she didn't want to pose her pictures or even do an interview or be seen after she, she uh, crossed over retired as it were. And she would say, oh no, you just want to see the pictures of that lovely young girl. So go look at the pictures. She also said, why is everyone excited? These are like old black and white pictures and I'm not even like naked and stuff. This is what people are into. Um, <laughs> and she was sort of astounded that people cared. But I love that. She, I love that she had that ownership. She was it. not ashamed of, she said, no, I took this. I'm not ashamed. These are lovely pictures. I don't know what all the fuss is about. You guys are all, you, she said, you're the ones looking at pictures from 50 years ago. Not me, you know, don't look at me, buddy. And she, yeah, she thought it was looking. cool. Yeah. But she, she wouldn't do interviews and they would bug her. They would say, we'll, we'll pay you all this money to appear on this. That's okay. I have enough money. We'll, we'll threaten you. What are you going to threaten me with? You're going to blackmail me with what? You're going to show people <laughs> naked pictures? <laughs> Well, it looks, she, you know, she did it her way. Uh, you know, I talk about Vanessa Williams in the book and, you know, how she lost her crown because of stuff, but because of the, the nude photos in, in forum, but she did not go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I shouldn't have done it. I, I, you know, it's gross. I it was just, I, I was just a stupid kid. And she didn't say any of that. She did say that kids do stupid things sometimes. But she didn't put it in the sense she it was more about not getting the um, not signing them. You know, they, they just used them. And she said she didn't sign for them, but she never thought it was morally wrong. She did never. She never said, I'm sorry. She never apologized. And well, that's why she went on. You can career. also beg the question of, wait, they fired her from a contest that was about having women put on swimsuits and walk around in high heels Do not because she took started. off too many clothes in the picture. So no, you didn't picture so the nude, so we can't have you wear the bathing suit and the height. Boom. Yeah, Boom. Well, they, that's their line. <laughs> they drew they drew that line, but somebody else would draw a different line. Where is the line? You know? Where's the line? Where's the line? And who and who's who's right? Whose line is the right line? I mean, it's just so stupid, you know. <laughs> And so what you've done is you said in the book, you said, damn shame. You did, 
when you start doing this and you did the escort work and you freely talk about that and, you, and then you have you have a show you did a one-man show i love one person shows i have my confessions of a prairie bitch you have a musical comedy whore which is not as dirty as it sounds but it's well on amazon when, when we filmed it um we got a distribution deal and it was going to be sold as dvds but also streaming on amazon and the day before it was supposed to drop um, my producers got a message saying we have to change the title because it's not it's not appropriate for a streaming service that families can watch. So my friend Steve said to me, oh, they really didn't like the words musical comedy, did they? And that <laughs> made me laugh. But so we had to change the title. We had to get rid of the horror thing. And we tried like musical comedy escort, musical comedy hustler, musical. We ended up going with musical comedy stud, which is not my favorite title. But if you want to find, if you want to stream it on Amazon, that's what you got to look for. But if you want to buy a DVD, it's musical comedy horror. How confusing is that? Do they stream Dolly Parton and Best Little Whorehouse in Texas? Uh, that's a very good question. But there was a movie with Teresa Russell called Horror. <laughs> but I don't know that it's streamed. I know they, they it's available. I just don't know that it streams. I think after a while, I was like, we're not going to win this because you're you're not dealing with people. You're dealing with like bots, you know. <laughs> algorithms yeah that's a whole thing with the yeah. internet now I, like well when um my fabulous publicist harlan would send out things about my book and about my one woman show he had to put different things in the title line of the email he had to like do the asterisks because various press outlets had things that would automatically send it to spam because it said bitch we we are we are just the the conveyors of, the purveyors of dirty titles you and i what can i say Oh, this, and as I always say, I started the thing, Prairie Bitch. It, it, that's what people called me. I did. It wasn't my idea. People yeah, came up right. and called me a bitch to my face. Uh, <laughs> as my defense so was funny. the show. So you now, as I said, you do all these marvelous things where um, this whole anti ageism, pro body image, pro sexuality, where you have these pictures. And yes, you are very cool, very fit, who clearly are lifting the occasional weight. Um, but you're not, you're not 25. And you're taking pictures with the shirt off and in the underwear and in the bathing trunks and with the suit open, looking like a hot guy. Like, and how, how old are you? Um, well, I'm 63 right now. Yep. And I, I just turned 60. I just turned 60 last oh, week. Oh, excellent. Too. You look fantastic. No, um, you're not. Okay. You do. Um, the, uh, I started, I started posing like back in 1989, I did a couple of things and then over the years, a few things, but it really kind of kicked in like 2000, early 2000s. So for really almost for 20 years, I've been, you know, since I was like early forties is when my kind of modeling work started to really pick up. And when I started working with photographers, you know, I was not some photographer's cup of tea because I was too old. But then there were other people who were like, I love that you're an older guy and that you're in great shape. Let's let's work. Um, and so I, over the years, I've worked with many photographers, some really great artists and some people who were kind of newbies at it. So, you know, the, the photos may not have been great, but, you know, you can usually, especially now with like um, the photo apps on computers, you can kind of make things even like crappy photos look pretty good. But I continue to do it because I was just finding that it was such a great kind of an artistic outlet for me. Yes, there was, you know, I'm naked in a lot of them. I am aroused in a lot of them. Um, that's part of it. And that to me, to be able to express myself that way, the little boy in me is just like, good for you. You've always wanted to do this. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> yes, you've always wanted to do this. You've always wanted to put that out there to, to take the ick out of it, to take the shame out of it, you know? And so that's what I'm doing now. And, and I know a lot of, it's not for everybody and I totally get that. And I respect that. Then you need to respect me doing it, you know, because I don't but judge you if it's not your thing. I think that that's marvelous because so many people have said, you know, straight people, women believe after a certain age, well, my sexuality goes on the shelf or set aside. Yeah. I, you know, I'm going to knit and hang out with the grandkids or something. And that I'm not sexy. You know, you might older people say, well, I might, you know, find an, another person for companionship. And it's like, what is this 1927? What? And we don't think of that. And in our parents' generation, now, of course, my parents, they were theater people and lived in Hollywood. So yeah, they were still going for, they were I'm, yeah, they were still like, I'm 60 and hot. So, you know, they were doing, but 
yeah. most of our parents' generation, when they got to be hell in their 50s, let alone their 60s or 70s and in the 40s, well, we don't think of ourselves that way anymore. They would just kind of kick back and put on the baggy clothes and go, well, I don't worry about being attractive or said that's for the young people. And, but Which in real life, if, it, if, that, if you're not, happy, but often, that's the thing is often they weren't often they felt bad and felt low yeah. self-esteem. Well, I'm just not attractive and no one's ever going to love me again because it's all about how I look and youth. And people take it hard or and they, or they put their sexuality aside so well, I can't really explore my sexuality. That's crazy. That's not a thing I do at my age. Yeah. And here you're saying there's not an age limit. If you feel that way, if it's a thing that was like, yes, I would like to. You can. You're you're not cut off at fifty because from being sexual or exploring that or, or showing it to people. No, it's what I learned when I'm posting posting photos on Tumblr originally was that I kind of got put into like the daddy group, and but then I saw that there were so many that they were getting re um, blogged onto other people's blogs. And then I'd find out that there were like guys who like an older guy, an older Jewishy looking guy, guys, you know, younger guys like certain things, you know, the, if you have a beard, there is something for everybody. I think it's there's everybody. somebody out there who likes something like, like everyone. I mean, I think there's people out there who like older ladies. I think there's people out there who like people really? heavier, or thinner. I mean, good Lord. There's certainly enough people on the internet talking about feet. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was something that I, 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 I discovered kind of early on that I would get messages saying like, you have really lovely feet. And I'm like, I actually don't, but thank you. Um, the, feet, the feet people are out there. Um, I, I, there was a couple of pictures of me on the red carpet and I was wearing sandals and had a great pedicure. I heard from the feet people. Oh yeah. I love that because, you know, I never, I used to kind of think, ugh, that's so gross and <laughs> whatever, but now I kind of go like, I kind of get it. I mean, and I've explored my own thing with feet a little bit too. And I, and I, and it's, is it my number one thing? No, it's not, but <laughs> I totally get it. And so all the things that I kind of judged as I was growing up going like, ew, or I would never do that. Guess what? <laughs> I have, and some things I like, some things I don't, but I've learned these fetishes instead of going like, you know, cause some people are just, so if it's not like missionary position, <laughs> they're out of it, you know? Well, and, I mean, the, the fee thing's not my thing, but I'm glad I didn't waste that money on the pedicure. I guess see? I got my nickels worth. <laughs> and that <laughs> so made it even nicer for pedicure. them. Yeah, but there's all kinds of things that to explore, like, and nobody should be bored sexually because there are so many things to explore if you're willing to kind of go out of your comfort zone a little bit, stay safe. You can still say stay safe. Absolutely. But God, there are so many options now for any, any kind of toy you want to play with, any kind of person you might be interested in, or, I mean, there's, there's almost no excuse except for your own sense of self-esteem and holding yourself back and saying if you're you know if you say it at 50 i'm done nobody wants me if you say that then you are so you have to go beyond that and say i maybe i feel like i'm done but i don't like this feeling and i want to explore what's out there so let me see what's out there and because there is that that's the thing i can say for sure that there is someone out there for you there is something out there for you um so you don't have to feel crappy about yourself. Well, see, the old expression is a pot forever, a lid for every pot. Lid for every pot, there certainly is. And yeah. now Madonna is 60 something. She's my age. And she's, 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 got, yeah, she's got the Instagram account and girl, she's hanging it out. Like she's just hanging everything out all day long on her Instagram. Yes. And I, and I've read, you know, the good and bad of it. I've read, you know, she needs to put it away and she's not, you know, Madge anymore. She's this, that, the other thing. I'm like, you know what? I hope she's happy because if she's doing it and she's happy, then that's all that counts. And it looks like some of that is because some of it, I mean, some of it's like, hmm, that outfit's a little extra. I didn't think I'd wear that one, but some of it, it's like, well, it is. It's like, who's it for? She's already selling the album. She's already she's already got she's already got the money. There's enough money. She's sitting Truly. on a pile of money. She could quit. She could go home. So clearly, at this point, this Instagram is this is how I've decided to show my body at this age. This is my thing, and it, and some of the pictures because there's so many of them. It's like she she's doing this for herself. Good for her, you know. Madonna will always be like. I remember seeing Truth or Dare, and I remember after the film going like, you know, she seems 
kind of horrible as a person, <laughs> kind of insufferable in in certain things. But then she would get there were moments where she was very vulnerable and stuff. And I and her toughness and her work ethic. And I after that movie, I remember saying to myself, walking out of the theater and going, I need to be a little bit more like Madonna. Right. And the, the work ethic and then what the, the bazillions of dollars she's raised to help people living with HIV and AIDS. So it's like, OK, she's got the hearts in the right place. Um, and yes, people are kind of going, wait, what? Because I think it is mind blowing because when we look at other blonde pop stars, the era like Britney Spears and everyone else, it's absolutely focused on being super, super young. Mm -hmm. and everyone was like yes sexy more sexy take it off and now here she is 63 and she's taking everything off people are like no no wait no we didn't mean that <laughs> and it's well, like but, oh you wanted me to take my clothes off five minutes ago but oh now you go <laughs> well I, you know right now the pop stars have gotten younger you know than when than back then you know it's funny when you watch things like you know night of a hundred stars and you know, back then it would have like, you know, James Stewart and, and you know, and now it would be all kids, you know, I mean, because right. there's all these young kids and, you know, more power to them and everybody having a career. But Madonna was there first, you know, she, you know, she does, she earned the right because she opened up a lot of people's eyes about sexuality and nudity and, and expressing herself from someone who maybe didn't have the greatest voice in the world, but she had some great songs, you know, early on that I loved. And she, um, she was, I was actually at the university of Michigan the year she was there and we had some mutual friends wow. and, and it's, in the book, I, I say that she still owes a friend of mine 50 bucks. <laughs> but she does. I went, went to school with Madonna. Okay. And she brought 50. Yeah. So I, and I never met her, but she was in the dance department and she right. always danced, you know? So I, I, you know, whether somebody is your cup of tea or not, you can still kind of respect what they do. And I think a lot of people think that she's gone, you know, that she needs to rail, rail it in, but that's not Madonna. That's not that's what she not, does. I mean, I was thinking like, well, what did you think she was going to wear? What she'd been wearing her whole life? What did you think she was going to wear? A nighty? I <laughs> look. I wouldn't be surprised if one day she does wake up and shows up on the red carpet and she's wearing a nighty, or she's wearing, you know, a gown. Like you know, she's she she does what that whatever the hell she wants to do, and I have so much respect for that, you know, because because she is opening herself up to being judged. Right. But there you go. But she's, I mean, if she's putting it on Instagram, then she knows perfectly well, everyone's looking at it. So. Well, that's the thing. I mean, the choices that I've made in my life about being an escort, about writing naked boys singing about in my erotic modeling, and I do videos as well. I know that I've opened myself up as a semi-public person, because I do have a mainstream acting career. Um, I know I've opened myself up to people criticizing me and telling me what a whore I am and, and how stupid I am for ruining my career and this and that, the other. But this desire to express myself this way and take the ick out of it so that it it isn't something that kills a career or, or that I should be, you know, vilified for is too important for me. So I've decided to walk the walk and bring it, you know, bring it on. I will. I have something to say about everything you have to say. So. I'm I'm loving this, and then you also, <laughs> uh, but you you also are a personal organizer. I am, and I That's love it. Like, and then, and then he puts his <laughs> pants on and says, "Do something about these shelves." Wait, what? <laughs> Believe me, there have been situations when I've been like working with a photographer, and we just shot like naked shots and everything. That I do put my clothes, and I'm like, "Tell me about that closet." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, there's a filmmaker that I work with all the time. And after we shot some erotic videos, I helped him organize his closet. That's hilarious. Just for fun, because it is fun to me because I have that. My mom was the most organized person in the world. So I come from, I come at it, you know, very honestly. And there's something very satisfying. It's another side of my brain that I love. I'm a very it's like spatial person. Like I'm, you know, a Tetris was the only, um, video game I ever liked <laughs> and so you know uh, an organizing gig is like a big game of Tetris and it's really fun to me and I try to make it really positive and make people's lives better um, it's a great feeling it really is this is amazing and as I said there's got to be people whether they're gay or straight whether they think oh I couldn't that I don't believe in porn I don't believe in escorting but would look at just even the pictures where you got your tie undone the chat and go you know this guy's how 
fuck that he's running around doing this and I'm only the well, maybe, maybe I, I, I could at least be sexy. Maybe I could go out again. Maybe I, I could be attractive. This guy is older than I am, and he didn't care at all. So I get a I lot of messages like that. I get a lot of messages on Twitter and on my OnlyFans page where they say that they say, you know, I feel like I'm an old guy, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm younger than you, and so I need to stop thinking about myself that way. You know, I, I'm not look, I'm not telling everybody to put their privates on the Internet. That is not what I'm saying. But I am saying to kind of like get the icky out of your head, feel better about yourself, you know, start with what you have and, and don't dream like I unless I lose 20 pounds, I'm going to no. Do you today, think at today. one point you are you have a conversation you talk about a conversation with a younger gay guy but it's like oh no once you get to that age it's all over and you you give them what for <laughs> well yeah i mean are you talking about the very first almost the first page of the book i think yeah 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 because i don't know if we can talk about what he brought up at the conversation Oh, that's true. Is that that? Oh, oh yes. Uh, if you're old, that you would have to um, agree to all manner of extreme kink, or no one would have anything exactly. to do with involving you. Exactly, involving the fluids. The way I can say. <laughs> yes, um, and and then and then, but my, the upshot is like, look, you know, I and, and I felt very kind of paternal towards him, you know, because he was like, ugh, I'm going to have to start doing that when I'm forty. I'm like, well, I'm fifty, <laughs> first of all, and secondly. Um, I just said to him, you know, you never have to do it really paternal. I was like, you never have to do anything you don't want to do. Remember that. Okay. This is your, you're always in power when it comes to this kind of thing. It's your choice. I said, but you might like it. <laughs> he was kind of like, yeah, well, he was he, he, he was dissing anybody over 40. He was dissing anyone who was kinky in a way he was. And he was going, oh, God, you're going, you know, maybe, you know, there's people who like that. Well, as I say in the book, he, he, he the look on his face was if I just shot a puppy. Like, <laughs> but it's just I love that you are fighting the the ageism and the sexism and the bad body image. It just it's like it's so amazing. It's it's because there's so so much of that now. I think things are changing. I think we hear more of the young people saying, "What are you fat shaming? Why? Why get it?" They, they, and it's funny because it's coming from the really young people going, "Well, how dare you say Madonna shouldn't tell you? Well, why are you saying that people?" that they're saying it's as bad as racism or anything else and they're speaking up and I'm like great well I'll tell you something um I wrote a song that was meant to be kind of like for for a heavy set woman or man to sing that they're still sexy and that they're funny and that there's things you know and and they own, owners it's a song about owning your body and owning your personality and there was a, a young woman that I had asked to, if she wanted to sing the song and she listened to it she said David she said I can't sing this I, I, I just don't want any more to kind of put forward that funny and fat thing. You know, I feel like your song does that. And I kind of fought her on it. And I was like, no, but that wasn't my intention. And da, 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 whatever. And she goes, well, I just, you know, good luck with it. But this, I can't do it. And you know what? She was absolutely right. It was kind of my, as, as a kind of like a, a guy who kind of takes care of himself. I was like, no, you know, you're, you're heavy set, but you're funny. And, and it, it was more about the, oh, there's a song in When Pigs Fly called Bigger is Better. And it's about like, you know, a big, beautiful showgirl who's not your typical showgirl. And that was great for the show. The song I wrote, I wanted it to kind of feel like that, but I kind of, not ignored what she was saying, but I was kind of like, no, it's my song. I wrote it with good intentions, whatever, but I should have listened to her more, you know? And so I don't, I don't peddle that song anymore, or maybe I'll kind of fix it or whatever. Right, because it, it was her experience. And maybe someone could come to you and say, well, this is what it really feels like. And you might go, oh, well, let me, let me, let me write another verse. Right. <laughs> I, I just, I think back, I don't know why I'm bringing that. It's kind of what we're talking about, but I feel like I kind of disrespected her by challenging her by saying, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, but see, that's and, thing. you're all about like, look, feel how you feel. Don't make anybody have anybody make you do anything you don't want to do. Right. Feel what you actually feel. Be who you actually are. And and if you feel like you you want to like be yourself and hang it out there, hang it out there. And if you don't, that's great. And I totally understand. But don't go criticizing the person who has the guts to do it because they feel like it. Not to say, and I'm not calling them cowardice calling them cowards for not doing it if that's not your thing but sometimes that person who wants to go like this inside kind of wants to go like this but they're just 
they just don't have it yet. They're not brave enough. And I was not brave enough early on to own all of this. Like, why are you doing it now? Because I wasn't brave enough back then. You were the kid who was afraid to take his shirt off in gym. <laughs> yep. Truly. And then I was a guy who had a, who was starting a TV career and a film career and thinking, oh, it's going to ruin it if I do it, you know? So there was, it was just not the time until now. Now is the time I can do it with full ownership, with, you know, to be my fully authentic self, no secrets. Nobody's going to blackmail me. You know, it's all out there. Here, you know, there That's what I've always said. Avoid, right here. Avoid blackmail. Tell everybody everything. <laughs> exactly. Um, shockingly, we're running out of time. So where do we get the book? Where do we find you? If Where do we see the pictures, the semi-naughty, the very naughty? The Where do we find you? And, and if I need my house reorganized, which I probably do, <laughs> how do we find you? Okay, well, the book you can get, you know, on Amazon and anywhere you get your books. Uh, there's also a link tree, David Pevsner, that has a list of where, but pretty much just Google the book. You can find it anywhere. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I have two two Twitter feeds, David Pevsner, which is my kind of like more mainstream actor one, and Real Guy LA, which is my more provocative one. And then I have my OnlyFans page, which is definitely my provocative one, and that's Real Guy LA also. I'm on Instagram, dpevs, D-P-E-V-S. If, you know, you want me to organize your house, message me there. And, um, you know, but, the, the, you know, I'm kind of all over the internet. And if you, and if you want to see the photos, if you, you know, they're in the book, but if you Google my name and XXX, zillions of photos will come up and gladly enjoy them. I hope you like them. Smoke will come out of your computer. <laughs> Google this man. <laughs> Woo! No, I'm fabulous. Proud. Like I said, you're. I find you very inspiring, I, and so I. I. This is marvel. I. I enjoyed your book, and and I found it quite inspiring for Yay. for a lot of different in many different ways. Well, thank you. And this was great fun. I mean, you're so good at this. You're just so good at this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I know. I can sit there and go. I'm not wearing any pants. No. <laughs> Well, I'm not even going to show you what's going on down there right now. But I, I was working out before this, and so and I'm going to go back to it. So um, right, I, we could I like my tights. The people watching, for all they know, neither of us could be wearing pants during this interview. <laughs> You'll never know. So there you are. Unless, the, unless the computer, like, slips. Oh, sorry. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, everyone, for watching. This is the Allison Arngrim Show, and I'm Allison Arngrim. Thank you. I found my way home, close to